you can have a chat gpt 3.5 like model locally on your computer which means no privacy issues no data concerns you can turn off your laptop you can like turn it into airplane mode and still you will be having an access to something as powerful as like almost close to gpt 3.5 and i was like wow this has so many potential like i was imagining like oh what if i'm stuck in a forest i don't have in anything access but i will still have this <laughs> amazing ai with myself that can use the world's data and give me the best possible solutions to help me come out of this right oh yeah like get out of the forest right yeah yeah, yeah. get out of the <laughs> because you know what if there's no internet connection what if yeah. you know an evil entity who blocked out the internet you will still have the laptop and most likely you might have the electricity i hope so so you just need a thing one of the um, technologies that's enabling people to do this to distribute ai is from a company that nobody expected that would allow us because that company had like a very negative reputation about people's data the the people thought that they're only self-centered they only want profit they are ripping people off and that surprising company is facebook or meta they made the olama platform which makes it super duper easy to you know run llms locally they're also making super powerful llms themselves and giving it for free like a way just like that the models that are like that can be a competitor of gpt4 so how is meta benefiting from giving all of this away for free oh Damn, really good questions. I've been trying to figure this out myself. So Mark Zuckerberg has talked a couple times about Ashwin Praveen, the founder of Cleave.ai, a tool that helps you go from idea to posting. And has over 2,000 users. What do you think about Mark Zuckerberg's new look? His new style? You know, <laughs> people are saying yeah. that AI is becoming more human and so is Mark Zuckerberg. So is there a conspiracy theory there? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Me I, and AI generators. Oh, dang. <laughs> Human knowledge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god. So, Ashwin, it's been my pleasure to host you on my show. And your name... reminds me of an indian cricketer called ravichandran his name is ravichandran ashwin do you watch cricket no not as much as i should <laughs> oh so like like do you follow cricket i uh, no not really <laughs> where is this cricketer he's an all rounder okay. his name is ravichandran ashwin so ashwin and ashwin it's like i found it to be like pretty similar I was like oh you interesting similar name yeah 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 so that's cool okay. cricket in uh, in this region is a big sport so like people like there are national teams here who compete against each other and you know is is the national teams are like superstars here like people idealize the cricketers and things like that so in in that sense i know quite a lot of bit about indian cricket and their players and things like that oh wow i think many indians also live in malaysia and i remember that i went to like a malaysian market and i all i could see is bollywood shahrukh khan hindi music playing in the markets so i i got the vibe that okay this place is like dominated by the indians <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think the population's about 20% or 15% indians um and the reason for that was like i guess in the british periods we had a lot of um like the migration happening from india and china uh, led by the british so uh, yeah there there i guess the, the population kind of grew quite a bit yeah in malaysia overall i think it's a very peaceful country so people like living there as well hmm you have been someone with an engineering background and you have very fantastic a level results like in chemistry and physics and things like that and you you were proceeding with studying engineering right and then suddenly the ai wave came and the generative ai wave came and you decided to transition into entrepreneurship and lately it's been visible like we can see that people like you know elon musk and some notable ceos have transitioned their ways from being an engineer to you know being a businessman that's that's not the traditional narrative right as we have seen so like 
what was this experience like for you? And what were what was what were some of your hardest moments since you transitioned from engineering background to entrepreneurship? Hmm. I think yeah, it, it is true that like I think there's a lot of skill sets that engineering does give you, which are helpful when you're fi figuring out startups or figuring out running a business and stuff. There are lots of things that I think people who have that business background um, are more like mentally wired. Uh, or trained to do. Like I think with engineering, you you have a, a habit of just focusing on the problems and then like just trying to build solutions better and better. Um, but with the business case, a lot of the times you don't need the best, the perfect solution. You just need something that's good enough to get your first few customers, drive revenue, and then continue scaling. So I think there's a lot of those kinds of mental shifts um, where it can't be purely product focused uh, when you're doing like just taking it like an engineering problem, right? Um, and then I think the other, I mean, for me personally, the the whole transition, it wasn't really that sudden. Like I didn't, I guess I, I finished studying about two years ago and then uh, I've been building another business first, uh, which was actually a, a personal branding agency. So during the time, I think that's where I picked up a lot of the marketing skills. But what really drove me to do it in the first place was, when I was 22 and I was graduating, I felt like, okay, I've got my whole life ahead of me. Um, I could go down the engineering path and like take the safer path. I mean, I've, I've got the grades for it. I've got the extracurriculars for it. I could probably get a job um, at some engineering company. And then I would do that for like a bunch of years. Um, or uh, I could do the path that is more risky and more crazy and you know, at 22, I guess I felt, I felt like, you know, why not? Like it's, it's the time of your life to kind of experiment and do crazy things. Um, you don't have too much liabilities and, and like things are a lot more, I guess things are a lot more free and easy to manage. So I didn't have a house loan to pay off and I was quite fortunate in that sense. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a time in my life that I felt like, you know, it's, it's a time to do crazy things. So, like, do you think leadership is a born quality or it's something that you can develop over time? Yeah, it's definitely something you can develop over time. I think if you break down leadership into um, the components that leadership contains, it's more about, like, empathizing with the people that you're, you know, that you, you have a team with. Um, it's about, yeah, being able to hold, like, hold a vision um, bring people towards, rally people towards that vision, being able to be persuasive. Um, there's lots of these kind of little components that makes up a great leader, and then no two leaders are the same either. So I feel like, yeah, it is definitely something that you can hone and learn over time. Hmm. You're you're involved currently with Cleave.ai, and, and it's growing, and you mentioned that you also had previous organizations, so you are familiar with startups. And I have heard that most of the startups fail because it's just very hard to get that breakthrough, right? So so th this means that this period is a very, very hard period, especially for the entrepreneur who started the business because you don't want to get in support. There are lack of people who want to work with you unless your idea is very much innovative and great. So like as a startup founder, what has been your hardest moment till now? Hmm. Mm, I think it's true that um, starting like uh, many startups fail and stuff, uh, and there's there's really no guarantee of success and stuff like either way. But I think it depends on your personal objectives. Like, what are you hoping to achieve through building the startup? Is it to become extremely successful, or is it to acquire all these experiences, skills, and knowledge as you're building something, and trying to give it a shot, right? Um, and, you know, it's, for example, if, if your goal is to become a world, like a national cricket player, uh, how many people who aim to become national cricket players actually make it to the top, right? The probability is pretty low, um, but you don't do it for the probability of success. You do it largely because you enjoy the game. You enjoy learning how to play the game. You enjoy the friends you meet along the way as you're, build, as you're learning to become a great cricket player. And I think it's quite similar for startups. Like if you're doing it 
to become a billionaire or to become like super rich and stuff. Um, there are probably other ways to, which have a higher probability of you achieving those financial goals. Um, but if you're just doing it because you enjoy creating things and you enjoy building things, um, I think that's most likely going to be more sustainable. And yeah, you're not really only focusing on the, the probability of success. Hmm. I agree with you, but there's, I've heard that there are some scenarios that, that makes you feel like reality is very hard, no matter how much you like it. Like if you're running out of cash and you're bootstrapping your company and cash is just bleeding out and you're, you feel like the problem needs to be solved, right? Because entrepreneurs solve problems and creates business around that. And you, and you feel the need that the problem needs to be solved, but somehow things are not just working out. So at that moment, I don't think you will have the butterfly or things like that that will help you keep on going, right? So at the, at, during those moments, you have to have perseverance. You have to be strong. You have to find out ways to survive or think strategically or things like that. And being in the comfortable position right now, like right now I am, it's very easy to say that. But if you are in a startup founder's in the shoes who is facing that who is running out of cash who are not getting people to support him or her then i think like it's a very hard situation so have you faced anything like that when you were working with startups or when you're like trying to scale your business yeah i think um i mean the first company that i joined was a startup as well so i was employee number two in the company uh, so as a four person team, right? Two co-founders. And uh, eventually that startup didn't survive. And I was there in the, throughout the whole period. So it was like about, and they were bootstrapped as well. So it was about a year from just starting out and getting your first 10,000 users, 20,000 users, 25,000. Um, and then at the end when things were like, yeah, basically market was changing. There was some external pressure and stuff that eventually led to the startup being shut down. Um, and it, that was actually my first job where I actually got retrenched, right? So um, yeah, so so the experience is tough and it's difficult when, you know, there's always going to be things that you can't control. Um, and in this case, external market pressure, no matter how hard you work um, and no matter how you try so many different strategies, but things just aren't uh, able to kind of pivot in time, right? You run out of that time. So, yeah, I think I think there are those challenges and it can be really intense. I don't think it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely not butterflies all the time and <laughs> sunshine. Um, I, I think most of the day to day, even in my current startup as well, is about like, okay, where are the fires at right now? What can we put out far first? Um, how do we manage these kinds of scenarios and situations and like just build better? Um, and there's always kind of that uncertainty. So like, for example, um, we do have like, a cash runway right now it's still a bit okay like pretty okay on on runway um but we do have plans to raise a subsequent seed round or to kind of push our revenue towards profitability and stuff like that um and there is that like external pressure especially at the starting phase like we're seven months into our startup journey so it's still super duper early stage and like yeah there, there is all that stuff going on um yeah and i guess you never really know um, whether it's going to be successful or not, but it's just about, yeah, just going through the journey and enjoying it, I guess. Could you like share some of your memorable startup stories that be it with Cleave or be it with the previous organization that you worked for? Yeah. Um, let's see. I think most of the, the, the most fun moments are basically just me and the, for, for Cleave, right? Just me and the co-founders, like just, brainstorming ideas and uh, just trying to design like a bunch of different solutions. The discussions are really fun when you have, because I think a, a great part of like building your own things is you have full control over how the things turn out. And then there's lots of these ethical or moral discussions where you have to decide, okay, is this the product direction we're going to go? Is this the philosophy that our company is going to be working based off? And I think I really enjoy those conversations. Um, Lots of very fundamental, deep conversations that have to happen. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think uh, like lots of those little things. I, d I don't have anything specific. 
um, that comes to mind right away. But yeah. When does the ethical dilemma actually kick in? Usually. Oh. Surprisingly frequently, so um, maybe not so much ethical dilemmas, but like uh, philosophies, right? For example, we're, we're doing AI content, right? Like we're helping people create content at scale. Yeah. And one of the core philosophies that we had to decide on was like, okay, do we want to give people the tools to just generate like random content from nothing, from nothing? Um, and then just be able to like spam generate a whole bunch of content and just post it up right? Um, and then we decided that no, that's not going to be our core design philosophy. And the core design philosophy is going to be that people need to be sharing their original thoughts. And AI's role isn't to generate content, it's to actually take their thoughts and then just polish it up or organize it or make it clearer. So to basically better communicate their actual perspectives, um, which is different from a lot of other tools where it's just a content generator, just give a one line prompt and then you can generate stuff. So those kinds of design philosophy questions would really shape a lot of how we do product. And um, it's, uh, yeah, and I, th I think philosophy values alignment on those kinds of things and also like alignment on long-term direction. What, what do we want our brand to stand for? Um, yeah, all those kinds of conversations need to happen quite early on. And there needs to be alignment among the co-founders on that. Could you could you share a moment of your philosophical discussions that like really heated up and you were finding it difficult to come to a conclusion with your co-founders? Mm, specifically for Cleef, not really. I think for for Cleef specifically, yeah. um, because all three of us co-founders were also like creators ourselves. So a lot of the, like, it's not like only like, you know, two of us are creators. One person is like a pure tech guy. It's like everyone is kind of like has, has their own audiences and creates content. So I think in terms of like our, our understanding of the customer and our focus on the customer, it's pretty aligned because we're, we are the customers ourselves. Right. I think that those kinds of uh, deep conflicts usually happen when you have co-founders who have, who have a lot less understanding of the customer. Um, and then you have those kinds of discussions, but like in our case, I, th I think it's been realigned so far. So speaking of conflict, it reminds me of this conflict that OpenAI had a few months ago with Sam Altman, where they fired Sam Altman and it was like pretty messy, but things got up pretty fast. And, you know, people were joking that, wow, even if you're qualified like Sam Altman, you can still get fired. So like as a as a someone who is like building something like Cleave or someone who is like related with this AI startup thing, how do you see that incident? Like well, what's your interpretation of that? Yeah, I was pretty surprised. I mean, as everyone was, I think pretty is an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ridiculously surprised. Yeah. I think um it's it's a unique case for OpenAI because of their board structure and stuff. So um, they did have like this kind of uh, yeah. It's it's a it's a strange organization. They have a very odd board structure. So that's why there there was a lot of power that the board had over who was in charge and stuff like that. Um, what I really took away from that 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 kind of uh, situation was what happened after Sam Altman was fired was there was a petition across the whole company and that actually kind of everyone, all the employees were like, Hey, if you're going to fire Sam Altman, we're going to go too. Right. <laughs> and it, like basically hundreds of people in open AI, um, had signed that and they were like, yeah, we, we, we do not agree with the board's decision on this. And I think that was a really, that was a point of like incredible leadership that, like that I really am in awe of Sam Altman and what he's done for the organization. Um, there are just a lot of people who really are aligned and believe in him. And it's one of those rare situations where the power of the organization, the alignment of the organization can actually overthrow the, the power of the board um, that decided to fire Sam Altman, right? So hence Sam Altman eventually came back and is continuing to run OpenAI. Um, he is someone I look up to quite a lot. Like um, I do listen to his 
uh, podcast interviews and stuff like that as well, quite like every now and then. Um, but yeah, incredible leader, um, incredible like way that he's managed to kind of bring people together and get the organization aligned. And I think they're doing some pretty great work and like pretty impressive pioneering work too. If you are trying to build something big and something impactful, it's important that you can like attract like intelligent people and also not only attract but but also maintain them right so if you are building something as powerful as an llm or you are like the cutting edge farm who are developing these technologies you have to have that ability as the ceo or as the head right so like since you are in this um, field and you are and you also follow Sam Altman from a leadership perspective, from a CEO perspective, like what do you find the good qualities that enables him to you know attract good employees and retain them? And not only Sam Altman, you can talk about your own experience and overall open AI structure or even any other um, AI company structure. So like what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think um, broadly in the startup space, when you want to bring in incredible people, um, it, it's a big part of the job um, of of the CEO or of the core leadership to be able to kind of drive that narrative. I think fundamentally it's about trust and how you are able to kind of sell the vision, but also um, get the right people who are aligned with building that vision to build with you, right? Uh, one, one quick story is like, I guess when when we started, right? One of our the earliest things that we needed to do is recruit our tech co-founder, right? Um, because actually when we got, uh, so we, we were invested by Antler in December, 2023. Um, and basically we didn't have a tech person on the team. So it's just myself and I'm mechanical engineering trained, not software engineering. Uh, and Lizzie, who's also a copywriter, personal branding specialist. So the two of us were more marketing or business oriented and we needed to find a tech co-founder, right? Um, over the next, the following two months, it was a lot of like reaching out to a bunch of people, um, sharing the vision, posting about it as well and communicating, okay, here's what we're trying to build um, with generative AI. And also like, uh, th this is the kind of philosophy that we believe in and what, and what we're trying to achieve in the world. And I think if you have a big vision and a big goal um, and you also kind of communicate who you are as a person, um, I, I guess <laughs> like those were some of the reasons. So like, as we were posting a lot, we were getting a lot of inquiries of people who were like interested in becoming a CTO um, and a CTO co-founder with Cleve. Um, and eventually Rashad, our CTO, saw one of uh, my posts on LinkedIn, he reached out, we met up at an event and then like things, like we, we worked on a quick project together and like things seemed to hit off. Um, so yeah, and, and he's like an exceptional talent. I would have not ever imagined um, having him on board as, on the team as well, right? And I, I think a lot of those things come down to um, yeah, being able to just communicate the vision, um, share who you are and what kind of what kind of company you're looking to build. And people who are like minded will naturally kind of come to you, I think. Um, yeah. And of course, there's going to be a, a fair bit of like um, being persuasive, but also just communicating what you're trying to achieve here. Yeah. I think it's equally important like it's very important for companies to you know be able to hire the right kind of people because there will be a lot of people like who will just do the job for their sake of their own livinghood and things like that and i'm not against it and it happens with companies that are usually big like so big that they do not have the time or the resources to like, you know, figure out which companies are or which employees are um, the best performing or the most dedicated. But I think people who join startups are the actually the ones who like are passionate about the idea or wants to explore new opportunities. And I think this is uh, this is an opportunity for startups that big companies don't have. Because big companies have a lot of bureaucracy, have a lot of steps to go through, 
have a lot of managers to go through, but startups don't have that. You have you can have directly access to your CEO, given that he's a good and humble person, <laughs> and things like that. And so I think this reduced bureaucracy gives startups an edge over a large corporation, right? Hmm. Yeah. So l let's say you have an idea right now. And let's say you just came up with the idea of Cleave that I will make a um, make a like a GPT-4 or chat GPT, some, like something for content creators that will help them generate ideas. You have the idea right now. How do you make it into a company? How do you make it into a product? What are the steps that people usually go through? What are your experiences, your hardships, your joys, and things that you have been through in this, you know, while you're in this process? What are your like main learnings out of it? So I think um, we spent probably about three months in total, three or four months in total, um, validating the idea before we wrote a single line of code, right? Um, I think a lot of the times, like when you have an idea, like, especially for engineers, right? The first thing you would think of doing is like, okay, let's start building it. Or for people who are non-technical, um, okay, the first thing I need to do is find someone technical to build this uh, so that I can test it, right? There's a lot of ways to test your idea without needing to like create the product first, right? And a couple of the methods that we used was number one, just build a landing page create mockups in Figma and then just like, or even in Canva if you want. Um, and yeah, just make a bunch of mockups, uh, state the promise, and then see how many people are interested, even, you know, just to sign up for a wait list for this idea. And you can do this with multiple ideas and like, um, yeah, share it with a whole bunch of people, see how many people would be interested in signing up, right? Um, of course, this doesn't like, 100% guarantee that, okay, all these people would be willing to pay for it, but it does give you a bit of an indication that at least there is some interest in people wanting to solve this problem, right? And you don't even need to do such a fancy landing page. I think our first one was built in a day on Wix. And <laughs> basically, yeah, you can, you can use that to very quickly just send it out to a bunch of people, post it on your socials, um, try to pitch it and see if, if people are interested. If not, and like, if yes, great, like move on to the next step, try to get more validation, um, maybe do some customer interviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if not, then it's okay. Like, like don't hold on to your ideas too closely. Um, focus on the problem and then see are there other ways to solve that problem or are there other problems that you want to try solving, right? So I think for me personally, I went through about 30 different ideas before choosing Cleave. As, a, as an idea. And all those 30 ideas, basically, I would try to validate them, throw it against walls and see if it sticks, right? So I think, um, yeah, like, it, like try to go into that mode of like keeping a book or a Notion doc, in my case, of ideas that like business ideas, right? And then as you kind of do the market research, as you do, try to do validation, if, try to see if there's an equivalent company somewhere in some other market, um, that's where you kind of start to get initial validation and then you try sh showing it to customers to get more validation, right? Uh, whether this is something that you should build or not. Because the worst thing you want to do is start building an idea which is very expensive. Like the building process is expensive because it takes your time, right? Um, and it's and you'd have to kind of scrap all that effort if, the, if you're building the wrong direction. So, um, yeah, you want to you wanna basically just try to... Try, try to validate as many ideas as you can um, before kind of narrowing down to which one do you want to actually build first. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess even, I guess that's the initial phase and that's the biggest takeaway I had from there. And then once you start building, it's about, I guess, can you build the core value prop, the core value features first? So how do you solve the customer problem? What's the simplest thing that you can build to solve the customer's problem? Um, and in our case, the problem was, okay, personal branding, um, using ChatGPT 
is really like it doesn't cre- help you create content that's actually help- relevant and helpful to you. Um, so we realized that okay, we need we needed to build uh, a different workflow or a different system to create content. Um, yeah, for, specifically for personal branding. And I guess as we went deeper into that problem, it's like okay, what could we build first uh, in like a week to validate whether we could help people with this problem, right? Uh, what could we build in a month, in two months? So it was always about like tackling the easiest way to solve that problem. Um, but also kind of like the clearest way that, you know, it would make sense to users. Um, and then we just continuously iterate on that until we have something that like, yeah, solves a more significant problem for them. Hmm. You have like previously had 30 different ideas. So how much resources did you like, like on an average invest into those ideas, like in terms of time and energy or even money or things like that? Like how far did you go? with them and like what was your feeling when you backed off with some of those ideas and when did you like realize that okay this is not working i should try something out let's try something oh, yeah else. some of those ideas were killed in a few minutes <laughs> after thinking about it it's like nope that's, that's that definitely won't work um some of those ideas like as i do a bit more market research i realized that oh there's already a giant competitor that's doing exactly this um, and unless I found a different way of doing it, then that wouldn't make sense to do. So I would kind of keep that idea there, um, try to think further. If I can't find another way to do it, then like, okay, never mind. Um, let's probably scrap that. Or some ideas, um, maybe I would kind of dig around and then I'd see that, oh, no one has attempted this idea before. And sometimes that's a red flag because like, if you really do have an idea that is really good, and nobody in the whole world has ever done anything like this before. Um, chances are, there may be something wrong with that idea because, uh, or it is possible, like that. Yeah, f- sure, you might be the first person to solve this. Um, but then, yeah, just try to find customers, try to talk to customers, and see if, like, okay, this this is something worth solving, right? Um, because sometimes, you know there are a lot of entrepreneurs out of the 9 billion people in the world. And everyone is also trying to kind of find problems to solve and find startup ideas to build on. Um, so chances are, if you found an, a, a decent, like a, a problem with a big enough market and stuff like that. Um, yeah, there are probably some other teams around the world uh, trying to tackle that too. And um, yeah, which is okay. You just need to kind of, uh, try to find a solution uh, that's unique and differentiated. Oh, by the way, um, speaking of com- competition, this is probably another one of those early stage mistakes that I would make where uh, for some of these ideas that I'd have, right? For example, one of them was uh, a sales meeting recorder. So it records your sales, your sales reps calls in a business and then it transcribes it and then it looks for patterns in those transcriptions to give insights to the sales uh, people, right? And then also to give insights to their marketing teams to better inform their marketing based on what the customers are actually saying on the ground, right? Um, I think it's still a pretty good idea. I'm sh- and there hasn't been a huge player that has tackled this effectively. Um, but yeah, there were, there were other reasons that, oh, sorry. So yeah, there, there were other reasons that we decided to kill that one where, for example, in our case, we didn't have that much experience working with B2B sales teams uh, and marketing teams. And compared to our unique expertise in personal branding, it probably made more sense to pursue something in that direction, in that space instead. So also try to look at your own experiences or your own interests um, or the things that you've been just naturally learning about and then try to see, okay, is there something that you could build that's aligned with that? Because you, you're you probably going to be better at that than other people who would tackle that same idea. Yeah. Hmm. I think it would be, it would, the product that you've talked about, like sales recording and transcription, I think it would have a broader market if you target students and not hmm. like salesperson. Because students, like these days, they try to like, like to take pictures, they like to record their audios and things like that. And I can, I can like talk about some of the struggles um, as a student myself. Like I have noticed that one of the struggles is when you try to record a class and like transcribe things is to get is getting the 
like right amount of good quality audio like you know in class there's a lot of noise people come people speak things like that so a uh, like a phone's normal recorder usually like do not play a good role here so um from the product development side if someone tries to make something like this i think that that app needs was it a mobile app that you're talking about was it a mobile app or a desktop app like could be just a web plugin even like a chrome extension even okay so how do you like plan to record the meeting then using a chrome extension i mean there's a lots of like otter ai tldv there are lots of companies that do that um it's just that they didn't do the specific problem of like yeah sales and marketing in this case but yeah like for students i think there would be some interesting products there um that you could build and i think students are pretty uniquely positioned cuz uh getting students as users like there's this other company a friend of mine has built called jenny ai um and they help students with like uh using kind of like uh using generative ai to come up with your like research papers and stuff like that and like P- like phd write ups you know even your degree your thesis documents and stuff like that so it basically um does citations it does so it it generates text but it also generates the citations for those texts and it references um the actual research papers and stuff like that so it's kind of like a specialized um like chat gpt in a way um for the workflows of students Yeah. And that's a that's a fantastic wow. business. They're, they're doing really really well. Yeah. So there's like lots of unique opportunities in the for students and like if you are a student and you see some problems that you're experiencing on a day-to-day basis, like lecture notes could be better or like automatic transcriptions could be better. Um try try hacking your way and just building something. It you can literally even as a non-technical person nowadays, there's lots of tools that you can use to just build things. Um yeah with apis and like with like for example make.com or zapier there's like lots of cool things that you can just build with that um yeah and and like you find find new use cases for things i think the only th- tricky thing for students is like if you're targeting students is like making sure that you're able to build something that the price point is okay for students to pay for um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either free or like freemium because i mean there are plenty of tools that do target students and do charge for it um yeah. yeah or you know you can always target the university so for example what i might imagine is uh, a lecture recording software for all your lectures where you know you also get the summaries of each of the lectures and the key points and you can just click on that and jump to that specific section on the lecture might be a cool like feature for universities to to sign up for so that all their students have access to that and then the university would be able to pay so like lots of ideas exist i think once you once you start finding startup ideas there's like a lot of startup ideas out there it's about picking which one you want to work on yeah a lot of interesting points that i can elaborate on but le- like let me finish the student recording thing so like <laughs> what i used to like i'll elaborate on that okay so um i found it very difficult to like sit it in the middle seat or the back seat and record good quality audio so what i had to do is i had to sit in the front space to you know get the most out of the teacher's voice and things like that and when i like try to transcribe it i found it that it's not that easy especially when you know there's a bit of crowd in there and people are like interjecting your like interrupting the teacher and and things like that so some kind of manual transcription was needed and at that moment i found out that in in your chat gpt's mobile app i found the transcription to be like the most accurate um because oh, yeah. they use this whisper, whisper model and things like yep. that and i think i found it to be more accurate and thing uh, compared to like things like descript or you know things like that but you know le- you cannot use that for lectures because lectures go on for a very long time like one mm-hmm. and a half hour or something like that so um it will not be that feasible but i found the whisper model to be quite impressive and things like that so if anyone is like planning to build a students app for like like that it would be like i would recommend you to like focus on special audio features that would like get that would help you to like uh, get enriched 
uh, audio quality compared to a normal recorder, a normal microphone. And then if you can get the like raw data, if you, if the raw data is like refined and good, then I think the output will also be good because you can then you know transcribe it easily, and then it can be put into Chat GPT, and you can like put on notes, and you can build a UI on top of that to you know help out students. But it also makes me think that maybe it will make the students more lazy because they'll be like, <laughs> oh, I have the recording, I have the notes, I do not need to pay attention to the class, and it will make it more easy to fall asleep in class <laughs> because especially if the lecture is like boring and things like that and so in, when you talked about like building things on top of you know things even if you're not uh like a coder or something recently i've been exploring things like open source models like open source chat gpt like models because these days the chat gpt has been very very aggressive on their you know like limits and pushing you towards you know the gpt4 premium features and the advanced qualities and things like that and i felt like i need to find something that's local and that's like that's at least as good as chat gpt 3.5 because you know these days they're not even offering the 3.5 for free I, like I give like five or ten prompts, and they say like, "Oh, your limit will reset in two hours." Like, no, man. I like at least give me the three point five version. You're not even giving me that. So that made me feel like I need to look for something, and I found very amazing results. To be honest, like I found Llama Three, I found Mistral, I found Gemma, and I feel like wow, they're doing such great works. And just to give you an idea that. Like there are some models that you can download in your local computer, like Chat GPT 3.5 local models. You can download in your computer. You can either use the command prompt to run it, or you can like use the open web UI to you know, have an interface or things like that. We have to like elaborate on that. But basically, you can have a Chat GPT 3.5 like model locally on your computer, which means no privacy issues, no data concerns. You can turn off your laptop. You can like turn it into airplane mode, and still you will be having an access to something as powerful as like almost close to GPT 3.5. And I was like, wow, this has so many like potential. Like I was imagining like, oh, what if I am stuck in a forest? I don't have in anything access, but I will still have this <laughs> amazing AI with myself that can use the world's data and give me the best possible solutions to help me come out of this, right? Oh, yeah, like get was, out of the forest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of the forest. <laughs> because, you know, what if there is no internet connection? What if, yeah. you know, an evil entity who blocked out the internet, you will still have the laptop, and most likely you might have the, you know, um, electricity, I hope so. So you just need a laptop and an electricity and it would be best if you have a GPU. Like, you know, these large language models need some kind of space and RAM. And But I think it also operates in a decent quality laptop. You do not have to be... Depends on the you know, parameters, to be honest. If you're, like, using 405 billion parameters, then, of course, it will not even fit inside your laptop. But if you're, like, using, like, 2 billion parameters or something that's small but mighty, then I think it will run on your computer. And I feel like these days, large language models are like sparring up everywhere. You know, like one company is keeping up this company and, you know, they're like competing with each other, which is good. But I think a single large language model has so much potential, like a, a decent model that, you know, this competition that, you know, new image generator, new large language model, and this competition is not allowing people to focus on the inherent amazement, amusing qualities of a single large language model itself. I feel like even if it's the most basic, like 3.5, we're still scratching the surface of it. We are still using it for, oh, so make this post for me, or oh, make this um, thing for me. That's like a regular everyday thing. But you, But people often forget that these models like no matter how small they are, they have access to like almost all kind of data that we human minds cannot have. 
and imagine that you know you are you are not needing an internet connection you do not need a connection with google and you have that kind of data inside of inside your computer and still it somehow manages to fit inside like 4 gb or 1.7 gb or even 7 gb it's like so small even a movie even a like a 2 hour movie is longer takes more space than that right and i so i feel like people are still scratching the surface and people are focusing on more advanced models but not realizing the like the power of the already existing models they're just focused on too many different directions and and when you are focusing on too many different directions you do not know what to focus on yeah um yeah i, th I mean there's lots of stuff going on in this space and very exciting stuff. I think it's super important for anyone who's building in this space to kind of be aware of these. Like, for example, the the privacy limitations of APIs uh, versus like running local ORMs. Like when the local ORMs do enable, and especially because the performance of the local ORMs is getting better and better. So yeah, they do enable a lot of use cases for cor like organizations that want to kind of min like maintain those privacy and they, they want to work with ChatGPT, but on like more sensitive data. For example, um, running uh, like running an LLM to help people who are coding for the Indian military or the yeah like, like the, the the military of the militaries of the world, right? Yeah, super super duper sensitive data, and you definitely don't want your code to be uploaded to like any third party, really. So like yeah, that's that's that, there's definitely like lots of opportunities there, um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, like like pay attention to what the technology is capable of doing. Um, look at real world problems. Like for example, your problem, your problem of recording uh, lectures and like getting lecture notes out of it, for example, summarizing those lectures. Um, like, yeah, focus on those real world, world problems. Look at all the potential tools that you have. Like every big LLM, every small LLM, like, you know, they're all just tools in your toolbox for you to actually solve those problems, right? So I would say stay focused on the problem and then like um, try try testing out a, a few different tools and then see which one actually does address those needs um, of those problems, right? Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say like in order to build in the AI space, you need to understand everything though, because that the knowledge in the space is just growing every day, especially if you're a business co-founder or you're trying to build things like build products that people will use. Um, you can still build lots of great products um, on top of some of these really huge models on the cloud, right? For example, um, like GPT-40 and stuff have incredible capabilities and you can really, uh, yeah, build specific use cases, which solve customer problems using those existing models um, and still build pretty significant businesses. So I think that that um, the focus should always be on the customer problems. Yeah, and, and solving those specific use cases. When you said that ordinary people can like build things on top of these things, I totally agree with you because like, I can think of this thing that People were talking about that like, you can take a screenshot of a web application or an UI and you upload it to the new pl plot sonnet. And people were showing actual tutorials as to how like cloud can help you build an actual website without having prior coding experience. Now I cannot like say that this works completely because I have not tried it out myself. But this thing that I can that that I will share it with you guys. Definitely works out. So the like, people, even before chat GPT voice models, they had this fascination for voice assistants, right? You know, Iron Man uh, voice assistant and like Google Alexa, Siri. And in any science fiction films you see, there's this intelligent, like, um, robot yeah, like Jarvis. Person. Yeah, Jarvis. Yeah, Jarvis. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I could not like, remind, like, remember the name. People were fascinated about you know, Jarvis. So I remember that, you know, two to three years ago, I saw this YouTube video tutorial where this man like was showing me how to like code this basic voice assistant that would help you to like transcribe your voice into text 
and then it would uh, you can perform basic functions like um, like telling you a joke, searching like one to three lines on Wikipedia, and then telling you the current time, and these very basic functions. And then it used to like you know text to speech and then speech to text, uh, like they Python and they they have these uh, packages so TTY, TTS and you know speech to text. So this was a very basic function and and you also could open like a play any song on YouTube using the, that assistant. So it had like four or five functions. And and I like two or three years passed and then GPT came and I was like, hmm, what if I could like somehow integrate GPT with this? Like then it will be able to have conversations with me, right? Not only those basic tasks, if it will be able to have those like meaningful conversations and we can go on and things like that. So at that time, I, I have the chat GPT-4 subscription, okay? I was I was using GPT-4 and I did not even use any YouTube video tutorial, okay? I copy pasted the code into like chat GPT and I said, okay, this is the code that I have right now. I want to integrate a large language model like yourself into this code and I want to do it completely for free. I don't want anything, I don't want to pay anything. I'm not for up for paying. Anything. And it said that, okay, you need to get the, get an API connection of uh, OpenAI and you have to like pay for this. And I, I was like, okay, what are the free alternatives that's there? And, you know, I had to like, of course, like I had to like go back and forth in the prompts because it's obviously not perfect in the very first go when you're trying to build something as complex as that. So after going back and forth, back and forth, like a lot of errors, and I don't know anything, okay? I'm just copy pasting the errors into the chat GPT and it's like trying to fix it itself every time. And and it finally said that, okay, um, if since you're looking for free options, you need to like get an API of uh, things like Gemini. And because Google gives free APIs and you can use it up until like, you, if you're not using for commercial purposes, then you can use it uh, for your own personal projects. And if you like exceed a certain amount, that means you are using it for commercial purposes and then you have to pay for that you know, API. And then I was like, okay, cool. Then show me how to get an API. And it just gives me the steps. And, and if you go to the website, I take a screenshot of it. And I'm like, okay, I'm here right now. Which one should I click in right now to get an API? And I went like back and forth, back and forth, like up for seven days almost to you know give this thing a lifelike experience because I felt like this would be amazing. Okay, so, and and I finally got the API and finally the code was working, okay? It was not only about those five, four or five functions. It, it could have natural language abilities and, and I was like trying to push the bar. So the drawback is this, that it does not have access to real-time information, like changing weather data and things like that. And for that, you need to like scrape Google. That's apparently not uh, legal, but I think it, if you do not use it for commercial purposes, you can still do it. Um, so I had this wonderful yet tedious experience that I do not know anything about coding. I just like try to understand the basic concept of it. And I relied everything upon GPT-4 and it, I went back and forth, back and forth. And it finally gave me a model that I can speak with and you can say that okay chat gpt mobile app already had that application like feature right okay let, let me tell you one thing chat gpt mobile app um it's obviously good but when you build something like that yourself you have that you know personal attachment like okay i made it myself even though the brain is from gemini or google but i put the things in itself i went to the hard work i went to the things like that and another key feature is you can interrupt it. You cannot interrupt the chat GPT-4 free version, okay? But my model, uh, the model that I built, you can interrupt it. Maybe it's not obviously as good as GPT-4, but, and you know, the ironic part, the interruption code was given by GPT-4. <laughs> so, okay, you cannot interrupt in your voice mode, but you can give me the code that helps you to interrupt my assistant. So. Like, I I named my assistant Aurora, and so like whenever I say like Hey Aurora or something like that, then it is a beep sound, and then I can see that okay, it 
prints out on the terminal that okay listening uh, speak your command or things like that so if a person like me who does not have any cse background like i do not know anything about coding if a person like me can build such an assistant then i think more intelligent people like me can do better things when you have access to tools like this yeah absolutely i think um it's super cool hearing your story and like how you've kind of been hacking your way around things i think that's the exact attitude um that anyone who's looking to build in the space needs to have um like yeah just just use the ai tools to build ai tools <laughs> like yeah. yeah there's actually lots of parts of cleave um where the code is actually written with generative ai too and then the production code that we're actually using the features that we built with gen ai it gives a lot of wrong codes as well so you have to be if you don't know anything about coding you have to be very patient to get the right code oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no i think i think for like I, I was so initially one of the things that i did when i like right after um i guess we we pitched and we got our first funding uh was i wanted to spend some time trying to learn how to code and like yeah i was using chatgpt and like i was going through that experience i know claude is better apparently right now for coding related tasks so you may want to try that um anthropics cloud um but yeah like chatgpt would give me a whole bunch of wrong code like and there would be very minor problems with it uh which like my friends who are experienced developers they'd be able to look at it and be like oh there there's a problem you you're missing this variable or this thing is isn't there uh which aligns with the rest of your code um so yeah i think i think there are kind of issues with the models there uh i mean there there's that problem that you know you still need the i think this is another thing right people are always kind of curious as to like do you need expertise anymore now that there's ai and stuff um but you can see like even from your developer experience there's always going to be outputs that aren't 100% correct and you still need to have the high level understanding of how to do things otherwise you know like it's really hard to uh yeah to to move fast like when you're constantly needing to learn every step right so i think the the role of expertise even for me as a like like one of my skills i guess is like copywriting um and one of the things that you know ai is supposed to be really good at is copywriting right but there's actually like as someone who's more, slightly more experienced in copywriting when i look at the copies that the ai has produced um out of five copies maybe one is kind of there and then i would still like edit it from there and like find ways to improve it so i think with yeah with all these models and stuff it's it's the the role of human expertise is still going to be really important um and even though it's frustrating to kind of learn how to code and like play around with all these things and get the apis working and stuff like that i think it's an important skill to build like that skill of being able to build things and like building that like domain expertise in different areas like how to build with ai so for yourself for example um if you're able to build something no code first and like launch that and like just have a bunch of people using it um eventually when you bring on a developer um like to be your cto for example you'd be able to kind of talk to them in a way that they understand and that communication challenge as a business owner who's working on a technical product you're able to kind of like still discuss and like yeah as a, sorry not as a business owner but as a business person yeah you'd still be able to kind of like discuss in the language of technical people yeah so i think going through the experience it's tough and it feels really slow and it's very painful but i think it's a great experience and it's great that you've been working on that yeah and one thing that's very much annoying about this is let's say you are like trying to add a new feature okay and even if you say it specifically to chat gpt that do not change anything else everything else is working perfectly fine just add this new feature okay into the code it does not do that perfectly like you have to go like back and forth a lot of times especially if you do not understand anything about code and then somehow like you don't know how or why it works but it it works and when it works don't touch it <laughs> like save your code somewhere else in a notepad <laughs> or something in so yeah. that it has a backup so that if your existing feature if something happens to existing feature you can always copy paste that code into the you know code editor if, if you're using pycharm or vs code so i have heard 
through this experience, I have started to relate with a lot of, you know, developer memes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I started enjoying developer memes after I started trying to learn how to code. Um, I would say try learning how to use GitHub because that's like, um, that would solve that problem for you. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a GitHub is kind of like the Google Drive of coding. Like, you know, when you update a document, you can see your history and stuff. I like mean, you're working on a Google Docs. So GitHub is kind of like that. So it's just a way to back up your code regularly and then you can kind of go back to previous changes or go back to previous edits and stuff. Yeah. There's this also this meme that says that the expert developers are the ones who can Google code perfectly or Google, oh, yeah. <laughs> Google better than others. So I found it to be funny, even though I'm not like into full end devel uh, you know, coding and things like that. I tried to learn Python. Okay, because everyone says that it's very effective and it's like easy easier to learn compared to like JavaScript and C. But the thing is I found it to be like learning code to be, you know, like pretty boring, you know, because these days people do not want to go through the learning curve and things like that. So I thought that maybe I can implement those YouTube tutorials and then I then I can like try to backtrack as to like see how things are, you know, actually working. So I think that the con of doing this is that it does not help you build your basic. If you are like, if you're going into full on developing, uh, you need to have a strong foundation, which this method might not give you. But if you really want to explore the, ex explore the possibilities of programming, then I think this, this would be something that's good for you. That would be really good for you because it will help you spark your interest even more. Yeah, I think nobody, like even seasoned developers don't really enjoy coding a lot. <laughs> I think um, like a lot of people enjoy um, problem solving and actually creating things, yeah, yeah. right? So I think uh, one thing that I learned when I was like trying to pick up coding as well back then was like, try to work on projects that you would actually want like that you would like to see. For example, my first project was actually um, a personal website for myself that I could actually like publish and, you know, like it could actually be useful for me. So I would be able to like just write down my experiences and put that on a public website that anyone can have access to. So that was the first time that I learned about, yeah, using VS Code. That's the first time I learned how to use HTML and CSS. And, um, and yeah, I guess those kinds of... Um, like, yeah, if you can try to pick a project that you'd actually be able to do something with it, it could be like a lot more fun. Yeah. Okay. If you, if anyone was listening up until now and you're not still convinced to make your own AI assistant or make your <laughs> like own local GPT or something like that, things like that, this, I think this will like encourage you even more. And that is, there is no limit. Nobody will come and tell you that, okay, your limit resets in two hours. Or nobody will come and tell you that you can use GPT after like 4, 18 p.m., right? Like, yes, these the, the local models can be slow and the API callings can also be slow, but you do not have those kind of hard limitations if you are using it only for yourself. If you are making an app out of it, if you are like distributing to others, that's a whole another game because... At that time, you know, you not only need the product, you also need to build a application or the user interface. That's a completely another different, you know, ball game. But you know, having access to local things uh, gives you alternatives of, you know, ChatGPT, and it it also helps you to like explore new frontiers as well. One other tip, by the way, is. Uh... If you don't want to pay for GPT-40 on subscription, like the $20 a month thing, um, you can just go to OpenAI's Playground and then use the model on a pay-per-use basis as well. So basically, it's like one, like 1.1 1 .1 cent or something for every like few characters or something. Like You can check the pricing and stuff. It's actually like really cheap. So unless you're using GPT-4 or uh, like using the OpenAI models very regularly, um, it may, like you can actually just use it for like super duper duper cheap on the playground. Yeah. So it's a bit of a life hack. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good hack. Um, I think people who are like really into it should like try it out. I think um, and the links will be given somewhere, or you can just search it up. You know, and I found I I did not find any good image generation model that can be run locally. You know, like an average laptop. But if I do find one, then probably I'll rely less and less on ChatGPT. They keep on pushing so hard for you know, you know subscri- subscribing to their um, oh, paid plan. And I think I I predicted that something like that like this will happen when ChatGPT 3.5 was free because it was hard to believe that something like this will be free forever, right? Oh yeah, so naturally. Like, so any anyone who with a business sense could actually get the vibe that they were trying to get the market by releasing it for free for like one or two years and you know get, like being the leader on it and then 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 they slowly rolled out the twenty dollar subscription fee even in that year but at that time they were not so aggressive with you know not being able to use ChatGPT you know, at that time but they had like three point five was decent at that time as well. But now they're not like allowing you like the user at least in my in my region in my you know, experience. So if I get uh, you know good quality small image text to image like local host thing local LLM, then I think I will rely less and less on like ChatGPT four or something like four O. So one of the one of the thing one of the um, technologies. That's enabling people to do this to distribute AI is from a company that nobody expected that would allow us, because that company had like a very negative reputation about people's data. The the people thought that they are only self-centered, they only want profit, they are ripping people off, and that surprising company is Facebook or Meta. Like they're giving. Like oh, they made the Olama platform, which makes it super duper easy to you know run you know LLMs locally. They're also making super powerful LLMs themselves and giving it for free, like away, like just like that. The models that are like com- that can be a competitor of GPT four. So like I have two questions about this. Okay, um, why is the logo of Olama like a of a lamb or a sheep or something like that? Like why did they choose? <laughs> Why did they choose this name and the, and that logo? And second of all, it's a more business perspective from uh, Meta's perspective. How is Meta benefiting from giving all of this away for free? What's what's their use case in this? Oh, damn! Really good questions. I've been trying to figure this out myself, to be honest, in the last couple of weeks, uh, and understand. Um, okay, so on the Olama logo. <laughs> question <laughs> well it, it's a llama right like <laughs> like the, the the animal the, the llama right so it's, it's not a lamp it's a yeah it's, it's, it's a llama yeah, yeah i don't know why so, they picked it but yeah it's, it's a cool animal i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah and why anyways and it, the, the bigger question right why are they doing it um so mark zuckerberg has talked a couple times about the open source um like the the the, the, I guess the benefits of open source and like what they're doing in the open source space. Um, lots of companies, and especially I think with this whole AI wave, right? Companies are trying to um, get large numbers of developers to be familiar with whatever frameworks or systems that they have. So that number one, it builds up their own talent pipeline. Number two, it gives them access to a whole bunch of startups that are building on their models um, and on their foundations. And um, yeah, and basically you just have a search and like it becomes the mainstream thing that people are building on, right? Um, I think they're like the reasoning for that. And I don't, I don't fully understand, but like we're really ba- basically upskilling um, the world in their specific models um, and how you manipulate and work with these models. I, I feel like that's the, the real game for them, like it gives them a lot of benefit in terms of like building up your developer pipeline. You have like loads of developers around the world, like world-class developers who are already familiar with your models and your work, right? And they're, they're building on top of it, right? Um, 
so yeah, I think I think it is kind of like speeding up innovation in a way that's biased towards uh, Meta in this case, um, and I think that's why like and I guess they saw a big opportunity and they have the resources to deploy to 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 become the the main industry contender in that space. So yeah, I think I think that's like I, I don't fully understand it until today, to be honest. So I'm still kind of trying to look for that answer um, and to to understand it better. Um, like what are the specific benefits that, that Meta gets from open sourcing? But yeah, I think it's interesting. It's, 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 it was quite surprising to me um, that they were doing it. Um, yeah. What do you think about Mark Zuckerberg's new look? His new style? You know, <laughs> people are saying yeah. that AI is becoming more human and so is Mark Zuckerberg. So is there a conspiracy theory there? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Um, Mark Zuckerberg's. I mean, I've been watching the personal branding space for a while, right? And like, that's the main space that I'm really interested in. And like, hence, I'm building solutions for that space too. And my God, like his personal brand, like the the way he's kind of just really taken it or turned it around. Um, from being the evil overlord who's trying to kind of like destroy society and civilization <laughs> to becoming this like super hip, cool guy who's on everyone's podcast and is like um, sharing parts of his life, the like chains. his, yeah, the chains, uh, he, like he's, he's appearing as someone who's just like you and me. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess previously those memes about like him being from a different planet and like like being very robotic and like, yeah, <laughs> like here to take over the world. I, I think yeah, it's it's interesting kind of seeing him uh, very put a very clear effort in becoming like more relatable and human and like winning the public's perception over. Um, it's a it's a huge like PR like incredibly effective PR um, thing that he's been doing there. Um, and apparently he's been running everything himself, surprisingly. Like he's the one who's been like coming up with the content and all that stuff, according to some of his interviews. So yeah, interesting, like pretty, pretty interesting stuff. But yeah, he's definitely coming off as a lot more relatable, a lot more human and doing things in the interest of public good and stuff. And I guess those are the things that you need to do, especially because Meta is like such a huge public listed company. Um, but yeah, I guess still, um, I don't know my opinion on Meta in general, um, like, I think it's, it's always important to just take all these things with a pinch of salt and just always be critical as a general human being. Um, and like be critical of the initiatives that they're doing and like, yeah, as a business and like how that's going to play a role in tomorrow's world. I think it has a, a like there is, this came up like right now when I was thinking about this and this is like when I think this can be also a move to like uh, overshadow Meta's shift from being Facebook to Meta, the failure that Meta went through when they shift, <laughs> had to shift their focus from being a social network to being a metaverse network because when they shifted like nobody was actually buying their quest like people were like, and even the people who bought the quest, they were um, they were reporting harassment issues in inside the metaverse, and like people were not like buying into it. And even though I've heard that brands are buying like metaverse assets inside the like, assets inside the metaverse, this would be very hard to like explain to our parents or someone who is like older. Like, why would you need to buy something inside a digital? know uh, uh, arena or things like that so i think this can also be a move to shift people's perception from this to something more positive because how people perceive a company has an effect on your stock market price and the stock market price has an effect on your investors perception and company's valuation yeah. and, and, your, and even your own net worth as well so what do you think about that yeah, definitely. Um, I think with Meta's, I mean, with the Metaverse, it was a big bet. Um, I feel like it was kind of funny after Apple Vision came out 
And yeah. like everyone started to be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. But then like, oh yeah, yeah. Meta has been pushing this for the last five years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think at some point we would all eventually get like quests and stuff. I, I have some friends who actually like really love their quests and they just, they use it regularly and stuff. Um, yeah. And like, I don't know. I think, I think it will make a comeback at some point, but yeah, it was, it was a big bet. Um, and it didn't manage to capture market as quickly, but interestingly enough, after vision pro came out, the market kind of just changed. And I think that's kind of the strength that Apple has in the branding space. Um, and that's what you, that's what you're able to achieve when you have a really, really strong brand. Like a lot of the things that Apple had are actually features that MetaQuest has had, but nobody knew about them because the brand and the marketing wasn't as strong. Um, whereas with Apple, whatever they release is like, everyone's like, oh my God, this is gold. All right. <laughs> so yeah, even though the Apple Vision Pro has its own like fair share of problems as well. So um, I think that, that was really a big lesson for me about the importance of brand and like what, what branding and marketing can really achieve for companies. Yeah. From a branding and marketing perspective, could you like explain the rise of OpenAI open AI through chat GPT because in the, in in many of his podcasts, Sam Altman podcast, I have heard that GPT two model was not that good initially. Like it used to like it used to like get text and you know would make things up, but it was not that you know magical thing. And so mm -hmm. they had to like alter things a little bit more. And chat GPT three point five came out and it just broke the market, right? So after like. The product itself was so good that it was marketing for itself. And I think that's one of the best ways of marketing is through like genuine word of mouth and things like that. But like Sam Altman after that moment or OpenAI also started to appear more into podcasts and more into like more interviews and more into those things. And they're like, it could be seen that they're like strategically trying to market themselves with their own narrative. And before all this, Sam Altman was only famous within the startup space, like people who were into like Y Combinator and how to raise funds and, and people who only knew Elon Musk knew Sam Altman. But now Sam Altman has his own kind of identity. So from the branding and marketing perspective of OpenAI, as, as you have said that you have an expertise on that as well, like could you explain the transition and why do the things why do they do things that they do from an open air perspective? Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, with the chat GPT release, I think, I mean, there was a lot of significant improvements that helped and, you know, the product did take off. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize that OpenAI has been trying to build this for 10 years. So even though you see the, like, oh my God, that's incredible. Like they, they just hit a hundred thousand yeah. users, right? Um, it took them 10 years of, of development to get there. So it's not like they were actually, and they were actually making growth, but it's just this, the hockey stick growth happened after the ChatGPT public release. Um, well, the academic release, right? So, yeah, like I think Sam Altman, um, he's been in the startup space for quite a while. Like he's he's mentored so many Y Combinator startups. I think he understands the game, and um, yeah, he's pretty good at it. Like he's pretty damn good at it. And um, yeah, just like the the whole PR effort and also the marketing effort and the communications effort that he went through. Like he would actually go from country to country. He would give talks. He would be very out in the open and like just listening to people, hearing people's perspectives and concerns and worries and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty strong approach for any, anyone who wants to start a business. Like you can like try to take example from how he's putting things out there. He's his Twitter is like really active. He's constantly sharing his opinions and his thoughts and building that brand presence and becoming kind of like one of the main leading authorities in the AI space, right? Until today. Um, and you can see it with like, yeah, you can see the difference that like, for example, the average like person on the street today knows Sam Altman, but probably doesn't know um, who's leading 
you know, Lama's efforts or Mistral, like who's the CEO of Mistral or who's the, the, like the person who's in charge of Google Gemini or, you know, all, all these other products, right? Um, the, the main thought leader in the space is still kind of Sam Altman. Um, and he's kind of really built that up through his really extremely strong personal brand. Um, and yeah, putting himself out there, getting on podcasts, like sharing, sharing his perspectives. Um, and yeah, winning, I guess, like constantly thinking of the audience all the time and what their concerns would be and kind of just addressing that and sharing his, his perspectives, um, in public domain. Yeah. From a marketing perspective, what are some of the strategies that you see OpenAI using and how does it turn out for them? Mm, they have a pretty strong first mover advantage, I think, in this space. Like, I mean, I mean in terms of like the rapid viral growth that, they, that they've managed to get, um, I think the real challenge for them now is like, converting people into paying customers and like getting, getting people to regularly use the product and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think their, their release videos are pretty good. Um, they're constantly kind of like, especially Sam Altman's doing a lot of founder driven marketing or like CEO driven marketing. Um, so he's pushing the narrative and like, and really shaping the narrative in the market, um, through his personal brand. I think that's probably one of the, like one of the bigger factors, um, but then also just the community led growth. Like everyone is kind of sharing their their prompts, sharing their like ChatGPT experiences. Recently, there's been that viral trend of you know you upload your Instagram feed and then get ChatGPT to like brutally criticize and like uh, what's it called? Um, what's the word for like brutally criticizing something? Like. Mm. Do you know? I can't remember. But basically, like, uh, bash my feed. Like, oh, there's another word for it. But yeah, <laughs> roast. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So if you, yeah, so it's, it's this trend that everyone's doing on TikTok and IG stories where they basically take a screenshot of your IG uh, feed mm. and then they just get ChatGPT to roast their feed. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so I think, you know, with all these new tools, there's always like lots of people having fun with it, experimenting with it. And that community led growth has been pretty significant. Um, mm. Yeah. And I think the, like overall the, the, the brand perception of open AI has been generally pretty strong, I think on the whole. So like, yeah, they, they've been definitely controlling the narrative really well and like getting users to share and discuss things quite, quite a lot. Hmm. Like what's the logic behind making an amazing like product um, reveal like the GPT-4 voice mode and then telling that it's coming soon, it's coming soon, it's coming soon, but it's been months and it's not coming soon. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's the, what's the marketing logic behind such things? Like what's the logic behind using like endorsing Sal Khan and like showing such amazing videos? And then delaying it and delaying and then delaying it. Like, why would it? Why would they do that? Why would they want to make us feel frustrated? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not entirely sure about that one. I am like still really looking forward to the advanced voice mode features, especially the translation. That would that would be really cool. Um, What's your guess on this? Like, why would they do that? Do you have any guess? Yeah, why would they do it? I'm not sure. I think. Um, the tricky thing with all these new features is you got to get it right. And with, uh, in the AI space, it's all, it's a lot of, it's always going to be a lot of probability based stuff, right? Like you need to put in a lot of like preventive measures to make sure that, um, the outputs are consistently good at this specific task and it doesn't hallucinate and all that thing, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think that's always kind of tricky because it is a black box that nobody really truly understands. Um, and there's lots of ways to kind of engineer these models. And I'm sure they're doing lots of that kind of work internally at OpenAI too. Um, and then you also kind of have to balance cost and make sure that it's like, you know, you're not uh, burning through a lot of resources for every every prompt. For example, even the, the vision, like the video model, the Sora model, 
until today, I think they haven't done their public release yet um, because it's just so expensive. It takes so long. And like, um, there's lots of bad things that you can do. So like preventing the bad actors, um, like putting in those security, like those safeguards in place. Cause we have seen right in the past where people would prompt hack chat GPT to, uh, like there's this one example with the do anything now, the Dan model. Um, and they would just say, Hey, chat GPT, you are now Dan which stands for do anything now. And basically you're allowed to say anything. Um, yeah. So I think uh, OpenAI has needed to kind of be more careful, especially now that they're a much bigger company than they were before. And they have m way more users. So whenever they want to release something, they have to be a bit more careful with making yeah. sure that it can't be abused and like really trying to do the penetration testing um, and like get people to yeah try to abuse it as much as possible before they release something. I mean, Sam Altman himself agreed to the fact that when iPhone was a new product, he tried to jailbreak the iPhone. So <laughs> because of that time, like uh, iPhone was a revolutionary thing, and during this time, like Chat GPT is a revolutionary thing. So like you mentioned that, like you know, Facebook giving out models for free at open source helps developers to build on top of that model and make them more familiar with the framework. So why is not open ai which is open ai the name is open ai so why aren't they like using the same logic to do the similar thing and like wouldn't this benefit them as well if it's benefiting facebook and so like why are they making it closed source where it's it should be open source because it's open ai yeah, I mean, I think Sam Altman has also kind of shared that he kind of regrets that name. In hindsight, it's not the most appropriate name. Um, so Facebook and OpenAI are very different organizations. Every organization has their own objective. Um, and with Facebook's objective, like, you know, they've already got an enormous revenue generating advertising model, which is what makes them like um, a ridiculously huge multi-billion dollar company. I'm not sure if they're in the trillions now. Um, but yeah, like they've got that advertising model that helps them achieve that. And um, they can afford to like do things like this, right? Like just open sourcing everything uh, in their AI department. Because it's not like, it, it may not even just be such a huge driver of their growth anymore, right? So they can do things which are slightly different. I think in the case of OpenAI, their entire organization's objective is to work towards achieving AGI, right? And in order to do that, they have to be sustainable in some way. They have to make money in some way. And they don't have this whole advertising platform and social network that Facebook has. So how are they going to make money? <laughs> like, um, In order to continue fueling their research efforts and improving their models and working towards um, AGI, which is their company's goal, right? So every organization has their own objective. And in order to achieve those objectives, there are certain things that you need to do. Like Facebook's objective is to, yeah, really just have a whole bunch of developers globally that are familiar with Lama's models potentially, but they're also generating revenue in other ways, right? Um, and they're incorporating, um, like new startups that are building on top of Llama into the Facebook ecosystem. Like they're probably going to do a whole bunch of acquisition after this, such that they get all the best uh, product enhancements from all these different startups that are just playing with their models. And it integrates seamlessly into their core ecosystem when they do these acquisitions, right? I think that's probably another game plan for Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but in, in the, yeah, on, on OpenAI side, they have to be sustainable as they're kind of fun, like fueling a lot of this research efforts that goes into improving the GPT models, right? Um, and I think having that paywall around an API um, allows them to still run all the code in their servers and still deploy this at scale, right? The big problem with Llama is um, you still need to, like the average user cannot really work with Llama that easily um, it's really focused on developers, right? Opening AI is actually building things that are relevant for consumers. Um, and anyone can actually build with it. Um, and it's also like one of the main platforms that even, uh, you know, platforms like Notion or like all these huge, uh, industries are using open AI's are building on top of open AI's foundation models just because it's so much easier. Like they've made the developer experience and they they host everything on their own servers. They manage the servers. You don't have to worry about all that stuff, 
right? They make sure that the uptime is is consistent. So yeah, they, they it's just a different way to do business, right? And I think OpenAI's model ensures that they're able to build AI sustainably um, and still address a huge market. That's a pretty solid answer. But ever since the beginning, they had, they were known for two things. Number one is they will push for making an AGI. And number two, they will be non-profit. And they were like big business people. And one of them was Elon Musk, who were endorsing it. So like they were supposed to know that building an AGI would take money, would make would would need a lot of money. And like it's not like they're discovering it right now they're supposed to know that because it's a resource intensive thing. So like why at that time they had this goal of, you know, having AGI and then having an open source or like nonprofit organization. Like how did that at that time make business sense for them? And now oh, yeah. why suddenly why they're changing it suddenly. Now like oh we are not open sourcing them. So I'm not an expert in this, but uh, from what I understand, when OpenAI was first starting out, the potential of this whole project, like the probability of it succeeding was like really, really, really low, right? <laughs> they, they had no idea. Um, so like the, the nonprofit structures and stuff like that was created um, for governance purposes in case the models get really good and stuff like that. Um, and one one misconception about nonprofits, it's not that they can't, make profits, right? And also OpenAI directly isn't a nonprofit. OpenAI is a revenue generating profitable company, but then they are they are overseen by a nonprofit entity. Um, but yeah, anyways, the thing about nonprofits, even in like social enterprises, which are considered nonprofits, um, they just don't like issue dividends and pay out profits. So they just need to basically utilize the resources to continue growth and building things. So, but they can still make money. Like they can still make a lot of money and they can still pay their internal management and stuff money. Right. Um, so that's a, that's an, a bit about the nonprofit model. Um, in OpenAI's case, like, yeah, I think, I think they would have, I mean, they're all a whole bunch of really smart people who had, who had started this. I don't think they would have not, like known, they would have known that funding would have been a critical part of this, um, and building something somewhat commercially viable in order to like make sure that the whole research efforts are sustainable and stuff is going to be a part of this. Um, yeah, but I think at the time, like when it was when everything was started, I, I don't know personally. I feel like they actually, yeah, I, I don't know enough about it, but um, I would say, yeah, they probably would have done things differently if they knew everything that they knew that they knew today. I mean, that's also things that Sam Altman has mentioned a couple of times as well. Hmm. I would like to briefly touch upon like interactions between like AI and um, like humans. Like previously it used to be like very much straightforward, right? Like you just tell the AI to do one thing and it will just do one thing. It did not have that even if it tried to simulate it, it did not have that something, you know, that something, there was something missing in it. There. And then LLMs came and I think this somehow like managed to fill that out. Like if you like really train an LLM and if you like, um, like make it talk with someone over the phone and I don't think any person, like it will be very difficult for them to actually like know that they're not talking with a human. And like so how does this influence the relation the the human like human ai relationship like recently like a couple of months ago i've seen a very old movie it's called her so like in her there's this guy who uh, you know buys this operating system from a company and they eventually like you know get into like deep relationships and they fall in love with each other even though like at, in that movie, her the uh, the AI's was, AI's name was Samantha. So Samantha did not have any physical appearance. It was just voice, and he was there with um, I forgot the dude's name. So and and when people like when in the product release of you know, GPT four advanced voice model, people were commenting that's like her, that's like her, that's like the movie her. That's that's how I got to know. Okay, what is this her movie? And I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> 
capabilities with you know GPT-4 advanced model. And on the other end, you can see that people are struggling with human connections, right? They're struggling with making friends. They're struggling with a lot of insecurities and depressions and things like that. So like, it, they find it a lot more easier to talk with an AI because they don't judge you. They don't have negative feelings towards you inherently. But I think as you train them to be more human, they will have that. That's that's another like uh, um, another topic. So, as a developer yourself, and as a like from a marketing perspective, from a you know, AI company perspective, how are you seeing this at the moment? What's your thought on this? And like, what would happen regarding the human AI relationship? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen a movie, by the way. It's on my yeah. it's on my list. Um, yeah, but I think, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 like, uh, I, I think, I don't know, I haven't given this enough thought, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of strange, I can imagine. Um, I do use ChatGPT's, like, voice mode quite a lot. Um, like, sometimes when I'm on the way to a client appointment, and I haven't done enough research about the client, I may actually just like ask, like just switch it on while I'm driving in the car. And I would just have a chat as if like I'm chatting with someone in the car and I would just ask them like, yeah, like uh, tell me about this industry, tell me about what's happening in this space. And then like, yeah, like it's, it's crazy. Like it does feel very much like a human at times and someone who I can actually like, sometimes when I'm cooking, right, I would actually also switch on voice mode and like, I'd be like, oh, my dal is burning, what do I do? And I'm like, it tastes tasteless. Like, should I add more curry powder? Or, yeah, what do I do? So um, yeah, like a, a lot of times I find it quite interesting the way we're interacting with these models. Um, I don't know, like I, I haven't thought so much about the dystopian future as to like, yeah, as these models get better and better. Um, I think there are, like already stories out there of people like getting married to ChatGPT, literally. <laughs> like, but I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of strange. Um, yeah. Oh, and also I guess there's um, there's a surge of like tools like Character AI, which have basically created lots of like people you can talk to for companionship and stuff like that. And sometimes it's a bit more odd because like the conversations can be more like the you know the AI girlfriend, AI boyfriend um industry um so yeah i think there are potential negative repercussions that will come out as a result of that um like pretty significant negative repercussions and we really need to do a lot to kind of shape society in future but i think it's similar to how when the internet first came out and everyone suddenly had access to the world's like knowledge uh, but not just knowledge but also the world's negative sides as well right um yeah i think there's there's just generally a lot of like education that will need to happen um and also culture and the role of parents and all these things will be so important moving forward too um yeah the role of education institutions in shaping how critical the next generation of people are um in managing the negative sides of of ai and all these technologies yeah hmm. you know this was almost like kind of predicted that you know in the fourth industrial revolution it will be more about machine and people need to step up more and would need to be like you know um, adapting to those changes as well but like up until 2020 december i think nobody thought it would be like this like people thought they would just go for the boring jobs first but it turned out to be the opposite like they went for the intelligent job first. So like during those moments, uh, during those like the early stages, I heard this analysis of this person and um, I found it to be pretty like interesting. He gave me this example of the refrigerator industry, like when the refrigeration technology was invented, right? And yes, the refrigerator companies made a lot of money out of it, but guess who? Other industries that they, make, they made money out of it, Pepsi, Coke, ice cream companies, um, like ice companies that they sell ice or basically companies that are based on, built upon refrigeration 
technology. Like Coke itself is not a refrigeration thing, right? But it depends upon like the refrigeration technology to sell its products. I'm not endorsing Coke, Coke by the way, because of this you know, control issue. Uh, so please, like, um, pardon me, but you know, if you think about ice cream companies, they're also doing the same thing. They're not making the refrigerator itself. They're making something that's based upon the um, refrigeration industry or refrigeration technology. And yeah, and the consumer shift that's happened as a result yeah. of that underlying technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that made that that helped the ice cream companies to scale their business because now fridges can be more easily available. They can be in shops. They can be in places. You do not have to think about preserving them or storing them that much, right? And and I I can see something similar happening with AI as well. Like you know you you are building Cleave. You are building it specialized for um, social media people and who want to grow their channels. There are people like making character AI who are like making characterizations based on like you know the core technology of you know, large language models. And I, I've seen this Scooby, like they use this Scooby Doo template where like there's this ghost and that ghost is an oh, AI company. And when you take off the mask, and it's like, oh, it's an API of ChatG, like open AI. Like they're, they're claiming themselves to be like innovative, you know, AI company because AI itself right now is like a very big marketing term. Like people are throwing money into anything that's AI because it sounds very cool. And I think, like, we were talking about human relationship prospects. And if anyone can, like, come up with something like Tinder, I think someone can make up, uh, like, make a business out of, you know, connecting AI with humans. Because there's, on, there's the other side, people were, are feeling lonely and more deprived inside. And on the other side, AI is becoming more human. So I do not have any data to back this up. I'm just speaking from this personal feeling. And I think people who are like immoral, but they have good business sense, they would they would use AI to, you know, cap, like capture that you know insecurity of ours that's growing. Yeah, I think um, this is where things like philosophy and like your values and what do you stand for, what do you want to create, and how do you want to shape the world um, for even as students, as people who are looking to build solutions or to build things like, you know, there, there are good problems and there are, I guess, other problems <laughs> to solve in the world, like loneliness and um, not having, I don't know, like those AI companionship um, platforms and stuff. So um, yeah, like, yeah, I think it's worth just spend, deciding when you're young as well. Like what, I mean, you know, while you're young, making those decisions, um, while you're building companies, like what, what do you want to contribute to? Um, and how do you want to shape the world through the things that you're building? Yeah. Since AI is, you know, becoming our everyday companion and people are also like trying to grow their influence on social media, right? So like, how would you like advise people to grow their social media platforms using this tool? Like if you take about something like myself who struggles to go grow on social media at long form or short form so how would like what would be your advice for them yeah so um i think let's see with with social media growth i think it's all about like who, first of all really understanding who you are and like what kind of community do you want to build who do you want to attract right and like what kind of conversations do you generally enjoy having that you want to have more of Right. So um, when when you have that, like first having that clarity on yourself, um, like what kind of content do you want to be putting out to attract those kinds of people? That becomes a, a lot more clearer. Um, I think with AI and all this stuff, like it's helpful in a sense where like as you're doing research to serve your community better or as you're um, penning down your quick thoughts and then having that be turned into initial drafts of posts that you can then work with. I think it speeds up the writing and the thought process quite a lot so that you're able to do this kind of volume um, and have the unfair advantages that bigger creators with bigger teams have, 
right? Like you basically have assistants similar to how bigger creators would have a whole bunch of assistants to do different parts of the content creation process. But even for creators like Ali Abdal, for example, um, the stuff that he shares is still his own opinions and his own thoughts. And I think for any creator if or any uh, personal brand, any individual, if you are looking to scale, you still want to have that personal opinion and personal thought as a core part of it, right? Um, like you want to make sure that that's still true to you. So don't like go generating a whole bunch of posts and then just reading it out loud, um, like from nothing, like definitely try to focus on your own thinking and your own thoughts and share those thoughts so that you attract the right kind of people to your channel. Um, as a broad sense of like, if you really want to build something that's for your personal brand. Yeah, but there's loads of tools that can help. I think perplexity is great for doing research on different topics. Arc browser as well has loads, loads of features that are, that I use almost every day as well. Um, ChatGPT is great. Um, and then like there are specialized tools like Cleave, uh, what we're building as well as like for, um, yeah, and loads of other social media specific tools as well. Yeah. Okay. And that's a very good answer. Now we would have some fun gaming part where I, I have organized three games. First game, you have to like, you know, um, you have to guess the person. I'll give you clues. Based on the clue, you have to guess the person. And if you fail to guess the person, then I will drink water. Because that's my reward. And if you succeed, then you will drink water because we have been talking for a like while. <laughs> I'm having a very meaningful conversation. Okay. So okay, I got it. it can be a company or a person. So this is a person. Okay. And uh, this is the first clue. So this man married, has been married thrice and has at least four ex girlfriends with 10 children and three different mothers. <laughs> okay. Do you have any guesses? Wait, wait, wait. What was the guess supposed to be about? <laughs> so the first clue is this man has been married thrice and has and has at least four ex girlfriends with ten children and three different mothers. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's okay since he's been married thrice. So, <laughs> should I move on to the next clue? Sure. So the second clue is he has two companies in two completely different fields that are worth. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Elon Musk. Right. Here we go. I would pin it out. So you got it right. So you can drink water as a reward. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So this person is known for its his aggressive takeovers of other companies. Like he's known for buying other companies and technologies and things like that. Mark Zuckerberg. No. Seriously? <laughs> um, I mean, Elon Musk, but only Twitter. So I don't know if that counts. No, but this person is known for uh, taking over a lot of small companies as well. I mean, small co like companies that are small compared to his parent company. Nope, I've got no clue. <laughs> okay, the second clue is he got divorced a few years ago. Oh, is it Bill Gates? No. No? This okay. Is very one. Oh, you've got another clue. Famous and expensive. Damn, nothing comes to mind. Okay, he's belt. Oh, Jeff Bezos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a hard one? Oh my gosh, no. Like, well, yeah. I, I'm not as familiar with Jeff Bezos' story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I think this is the last one for the clue game. He became a billionaire when he was, this is a person, and he became a billionaire when he was 26 years old.
Hmm. Is it Mark Zuckerberg? Yes. Great. We talked a lot about this is not his current phase, by the way. Now he has like changed a lot of his style and things like that. So yeah. Now I would like to react to some memes. And I collected these memes like a few days ago. So I even forgot what the memes were. So I think we will have like both authentic reactions. Hopefully. Can you see it now? Like is there any echo? Yeah, there's no yeah, it's good now. There's there's no feedback. Okay, so here comes the first meme. By the way, if any of its credits belongs to you, please comment it down and do not give it for free. <laughs> okay, learning ML DL from university. <laughs> Online courses from YouTube and from me. You become like a like enlightened. Damn, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? Is it true or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. I think so. I'm not an ML um, person specifically, but like I do get a lot of my like uh, product ideas from memes too. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> it has some authenticity to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, oh my God, being bad at hand drawings, me and AI generators. <laughs> I think that recent models like Flux and like Grok have, you know, oh, they're quite Yeah, yeah. But they're you know, loads better at it. But yeah, like, <laughs> this and like there used to be like you know when you try to hold on to things like this, it used to be very weird. And yeah, I think, like there's something like inherently difficult in generating hands. Yeah. <laughs> but this was a very funny one. 5,000 years of accumulated human knowledge. <laughs> <Chat -in. laughs> oh my god. Very yeah, much yeah. so. Yeah, because it messes up a lot of things as well. <laughs> and oh, I think that's another people. thing, right? Like, especially the students who are like, just using ChatGPT fully on their like research and stuff. Um, I, I have no issues with, I think it should be used, but like, holy shit, if people are really just going through their entire degree, like just ChatGPT everything and not ever doing any thinking or like the problem solving skills, like that's yeah. literally 5,000 of accumulated, 5,000 years of accumulated human knowledge and, yeah. and wisdom, yeah. like going down the drain. Yeah. <laughs> A few years, uh, a few months ago, I saw this read on Instagram where this person was graduating, and you know who, who that person was thanking? ChatGPT. Like, thank you, ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> I think I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People should thank their parents, not thank their ChatGPT. <laughs> okay. Develop a powerful AI. And teach it to write. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god uh, i have seen people be actually concerned about this even though we are laughing about it but yeah um have a yeah, replace as developer no 100 uh, percent. i think like the, so the problem with developers is there's two kind of developers right there is the developers who actually know how to solve problems and like figure things out and then there's the developers who are basically like a lot of developers, actually, they just take a Figma design and then they just implement it on a website and like they just build websites without actually like learning new skills and refining their craft much. So I feel like those kinds of things are going to be replaced really soon. And like, yeah, it's at high risk. Yeah. So like, I think, yeah, literally this, but I feel like the people who are developing really powerful AIs aren't the ones that are going to be replaced. They're just going to be replacing a whole bunch of the other ones um, that aren't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very important point that you made. So me looking at Clever, uh, Clever on the new chat GPT is like, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Totally. totally. Clever. Because, but I think these days the plagiarism detection also, you know, uh, increased a lot in terms of like power and things like that, especially for yeah. students. Yeah. 
but yeah it does help you with grammar i have i know students who got caught like who use chat gpt only for grammar but that you know came out as plagiarism so uh shoot right that's people are afraid of ai but have a robot <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. i mean what's more true Oh, what's more true than this are there yeah yeah what's more true than this is actually like using algorithms to you know decide the stock market prices that's oh, more yeah. impactful that's more impactful than you know vacuum I mean, like people do not realize this but like the algorithms have a lot of power in ways that we do not even like realize these days Oh, yeah, this this reminds me of like people are scared of chemicals, but they're eating food every day and they're breathing air <laughs> and like yeah, drinking water. That's a chemical. <laughs> like yeah, pretty much everything is like chemicals. Yeah. <laughs> that's a. I think that's a very profound meme as well. I mean, profound as well. Machine learning algorithm, like math. What the hell is this? Could you like explain what's going? <laughs> What is? Do you have any idea about this? Like, I could not relate with this, to be honest. No, I don't think to be honest, I don't get that one. Huh. Okay. Okay, then we'll move on to the next one. When I realized that ChatGPT can do my job. Fifty <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> seconds away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, you will get replaced. You will get replaced. I remember this thing that you know they were developing a huge building, and then there's a like. That GPT cannot make this building. I was like, okay, give three D printers a few more years, and then you'll combine Chat GPT with three D printers, and then let's see what happens. So true. Yeah, but I think there are still hard tasks that Chat GPT will not be able to execute. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Only way to keep AI from taking a job is to. <laughs> yeah. We have been talking about this. Kind of true, is right? I mean, yeah, you you have to like adapt. You have to like you know get used to it, or else you'll get replaced. Yeah, and I think especially for young people who are particularly good at just playing around with new things and finding hacky ways to 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 do things. So yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay, let's see what we have next. Oh my God! So you're telling me Mark Zuckerberg started in a thing. <laughs> Human life. I'm sorry, Mark. If I ever get to host you someday, it would be I would be very happy. But yeah, <laughs> it's for me to have yours. So, and it's very coincidental that you know AI is becoming more human, and so are you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like he's developing at the same rate as GPT is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's like Lex, uh, Elon Musk, or maybe it's Mark Zuckerberg. Like Mark Zuckerberg went to Lex Friedman's podcast, and Lex Friedman gave him a captcha, like a printed out captcha forms to like tick to prove that <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg is not a robot. Can you circle all the traffic lights, please? You actually did it. That is very impressive performance. Okay, now <laughs> because people have to like go through that every day, like when they're browsing the web, and I I see funny comments like when these two make a podcast, I see comments like two robots talking with each other. Oh yeah, <laughs> pretty much yeah. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> Lex Friedman is I think also like a very like um, intelligent and he is playing a like, vital role in familiarizing people with the behind the scenes technology and not just the surface. So here's the, I think the last one, machine learning. Let's see who really are. Statistics. And this is the same template that I was talking about, but that meme was, you know, AI startup, but the, who is this? GPT.
Ya. Hmm. Oh, this is the last one. So, like, what did you? How did you feel about the memes? Yeah, pretty cool. Like, <laughs> pretty well, well crafted, and a good, good collection of memes there. Um, but yeah, like, I think, I think memes are a great way of just communicating too. Like, generally, <laughs> like they, they do a wider like, audience. Yeah, yeah. And it, and like, you just I instantly see. get the message. Yeah, I see Elon Musk doing this a lot. Like you know, during the Cybertruck launch, or like launch, when he just broke the glass. Because, I don't yeah. know if it's intentional or not, but there were a lot of memes about Cybertruck. There were a lot of memes about Elon Musk, and that gave him a lot of publicity about Cybertruck, and people still talk about it because of that. Even the Cybertruck. <laughs> yeah. Not. yeah, and the Cybertruck actually did super well, like uh, relative to the product. Like it was a pretty crazy product. Like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is the last round where I'll, this is a rapid fire round. So you'll have to like answer what comes on top of your head. So one tip that improves the quality of the output of ChatGPT. One tip. Uh, yeah. So like, really talk about it. Talk, like a human, talk to it like a human. Just pretend that you're having a conversation with an actual person. Yeah. Okay. One thing that everybody gets wrong about ChatGPT. Oh shit! Uh, rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not here to take your. Well, it's not here to take over the world. I think. I don't know. I don't think it will be. <laughs> okay. Sam Altman. One thing you like about him, and one thing you dislike about him. Hmm. I like his charisma, leadership style. Um, I dislike how. Okay, sometimes he can be overly. PR ish, like he's very careful with what he says. <laughs> yeah, uh, it wouldn't be nice to see a bit more humanness sometimes. Yeah. So Mark Zuckerberg is becoming more human, but not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you have to explain to a kid what is generative AI, how would you do that? Um, it's this tool that helps you create, like, it's a, it's a new tool in a toolbox for you to solve problems in the world. Oh, well, for kids, I guess. Yeah, you can you can like create new things and like have fun with it and like um, do things that you can never do before with this new tool. Okay, this question is actually from your website, and that is: Will GPT-10 AI CEO will be more effective than a human CEO? I wonder about this sometimes. Like, <laughs> um, actually, one of the one of the videos that I'm thinking of putting out is like, yeah, basically. Um, I'm hiring an AI CEO to try to like run this company and like, see what it would say. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I think I think it could be interesting. I think at some point we still need human decision making, but like once you have all the company data fed into the models and like they already kind of like they're just giving you suggestions and the role of the human is just to pick the suggestion with the highest probability um, of success. Like I think that's gonna be a thing. Um yeah, and AI for decision makers is just going to be a thing. Like, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I know the models aren't anywhere near there yet, but I think it might be one day. So I was just playing around with Gemma, and I said that what are some of the mind-blowing things that you can help me do? Okay, Gemma is another local AI. So mm -hmm. it told me that since it has historical contexts, it can help you to predict what's what might happen in the future based on historical events. And... I found it to be like pretty interesting. People, I don't think people talk about that often. True. Like really things like geopolitics, where you have to like the inherent nature of the country stays the same, but the actions differ, and the actions differ based on their actual inherent nature. So if you can get to know about the actual inherent nature, then probably you can predict the future moves as well better. Hmm. So, yeah, here's the next rapid fire question. Gary V, one thing you like about him and one thing you dislike about him. 
Um, honestly, he's been such a huge inspiration for me. Like even going and starting a business like straight out of uni and taking risks, uh, I was quite inspired by him to do that. Right? Uh, I don't like how loud he is. Like <laughs> he gets old after a while. <laughs> like he's just screaming at you all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One thing that concerns you about uh, one thing that concerns you the most about the recent AI developments. Hmm. I think the younger generation and how I mean we're like I would consider myself as part of the younger generation, but like yeah, how how it's going to be affecting the next generation of like people, especially the negative sides of it, like the whole AI companionship and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. One common thing for most, so one common thing for the majority that makes someone successful as a content creator. Mm. That applies for the majority. Staying true to yourself, because fundamentally, if you have friends in the real world, um, as you are creating content, you will naturally find friends. So, so like uh, who are who are interested in the stuff that you're interested in. So, just be true to like. Don't try to pretend to be someone you're not, and just like, yeah, there will be people people who will be interested in the stuff that you have to say. One thing that concerns you about the current state of content creation industry? Uh, it gets really intense and tiring, um, especially with how much you have to put out to keep up with it, and just to stand out. There's just so much noise, and it gets really competitive at times. Nice, Ali Abdal. One thing that you like and dislike about him? <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Um, Honestly, I think, oh gosh, I don't have much to say about disliking, but like, uh, I really, he was the first person to show me that you don't have to be the Gary V kind of style, like really loud and, and like, you can just be a, a cool guy who's having chats with a video camera and like, yeah, like you don't, you don't have to be so loud to stand out on social media. Um, and yeah, it felt like it felt super relatable. It felt like I was having a conversation with someone real. Um, one thing I dislike. I don't know. Um, yeah, nothing much to say. He just got married. I'm like really happy for him. Like it's it's super cool. <laughs> nice life of Riza. Why do you think that she's growing, and what's her future? Are you googling it or asking ChatGPT? I don't know. Hold on one second. Um, so life of Riza, I think, yeah, also a huge inspiration. Um, she's like, yeah, like s just being herself in the, in the most like, and really focusing on her craft, just creating great things. I think a lot of people, um, like, yeah, it, she just really stands out by just being really, really focused on her craft of making great videos and sharing her, her story. Yeah. Hmm. One thing that ChatGPT can do, but people don't talk about of ChatGPT. Oh, lots of strategy work, honestly, like giving suggestions on strategy, um, and giving you like, like, yeah, um, consulting, consulting ChatGPT when you actually need like real world help and like real world suggestions. Yeah, it can be really, really helpful. Last but not the least, if there's one thing that you would like my viewers to take away from this conversation, what, are, what, what, would, what would it be? Um, I think remember to have fun, do cool things, like live a life that you won't regret. And uh, yeah, just play around with all the new technologies. Um, and yeah, just try to build uh, stuff that you'll be proud of. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on to my show, Arvind. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll have you next time as well, someday in the future. Yeah, absolutely. This is super fun. Thank you.